You are listening to Parliament Matters, a Hansard Society production supported by the Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust. Learn more at hansardsociety.org.uk slash pm. Welcome to Parliament Matters, the podcast about the institution at the heart of our democracy, Parliament itself. I'm Ruth Fox. And I'm Mark Darcy. Coming up... Piers put up another roadblock on the long and winding road to Rwanda. Why one key Conservative backbencher still wants Mr Speaker to step down. And are they going to elect a police and crime commissioner in the West Midlands, or not? How did the government get itself into a terrible tangle over an election that is now due in just a few weeks' time? But first, Ruth, let's start by talking about the Rwanda bill. It seems ages since the government hasn't been trying to pass new laws to make it possible to send migrants to Rwanda. And the latest one, the Safety of Rwanda bill, is still stuck bouncing between the Commons and the Lords. On Wednesday night, Peers defeated the government seven times in the latest exchange with MPs in the House of Commons. What's happened is that they've made changes to the bill, it's been pinged to the Commons, the Commons has struck down those changes... It's now ponged back to the House of Lords (laughs) and peers have reversed the changes, put them back in again after the Commons had taken them out and now the bill goes back to the Commons. And interestingly, it won't go back to the Commons until after Easter now. It's due back there on April the 15th when MPs return. So there's not going to be an attempt in the coming week, even though both houses will be sitting, to try and reverse those changes. There's a bit of a breathing space going on there and that's attracted a fair bit of interest in itself. Does this betoken some sort of confusion or difficulty at the heart of government policy? Are they not actually ready to send people off? Were Parliament to pass the law? Yeah, so, I mean, if you think back to the start of this process, the Prime Minister and the government were saying this was emergency legislation. They've got two more days next week when the Houses are sitting. They could be considering the bill, you know, next stage of ping pong. They've decided not to. They've pushed it beyond Easter. And interestingly, the, the Labour lead on this bill in the Lords, Lord Coker, was pressing the ministers last night to explain why they're not bringing it back. And as you say, that's set journalistic uh, ears wagging. And, and things. Well, yeah, so uh, is there something going on? I mean, if you look at the amendments, so as you say, you know, seven amendments have now been passed back to the Commonwealth smaller majorities than the first time round, so down to between sort of 30-odd and 55. The Conservatives got a few more of their peers out in the voting lobbies, but not that many more. The word was that actually the Conservatives had soft-pedalled earlier votes on the Rwanda bill, but we're going to bring all their troops out when we got to this ping-pong process of agreeing the final form of the bill between the Commons and the Lords, and they'd deploy them then with the additional argument that uh, Conservative peers would be asked, in effect, to support the view of the election. Elected House of Commons, whatever they themselves might have thought of the bill, the time had come to bow to the will of the elected House. But if that was the sort of decisive joker that was being played, it doesn't seem to have quite worked. And the arithmetic in the Lords is still a little bit forbidding for the government with these 50-odd vote majorities for most of the changes Mm. that were made in the Lords being reasserted. I know this is all a bit techy and complicated. (laughs) It's peers put things in, MPs take them back out, peers put them back in again, and the process goes on as long as it goes on. I mean, some people think there's a kind of three strikes and you're out rule, but there is nothing formal on the rule book. It's just after three goes, sometimes peers lose the will to continue and say, well, we've tried, and the elected Mm. House has said, no, how long are we going to go on with this? Yeah. And it's actually that that process, the first ping, if you like, from the the laws to the commons, that has seemed to annoy quite a number of peers because the government sent it back with really no engagement at all on the on mm. the amendments, just a, a blanket no, we're rejecting all of these. And, you know, not much in the way of reasons given as to why they were doing it. And the House of Lords, I think, understandably, given its constitutional role as a revising chamber, is looking askance at a government which basically just won't engage. I mean, Shami Chakrabarti, the Labour peer, made, a, I think, a, a, an interesting point when she said that a minister in the Commons had said that her amendment that she'd been working on was both unnecessary and wrecking. And as she made the point, well, it can't be both. Um, <laughs> so it's the lack of engagement and the lack of you know, any willingness to contemplate that perhaps the House of Lords has come up with some ideas, some thoughts that are worth considering and, and, and worth looking at the wording of the bill and seeing whether you can make some adjustments and some amendments here and there. But just this sort of blanket rejection, this blanket no... Um, that will in itself, I think, not help in terms of 
persuading the peers to give way sooner rather than later. I think ministers in the Commons are probably just getting a bit sick of having their legislation rewritten wholesale in the House of Lords again and again and again. I mean, hundreds of defeats in every parliamentary mm. session suffered mm. by the government, often on really quite significant parts of their bills. And but that's I, the purpose of the House yeah, of Lords. Yes, yeah, that's, that's the purpose that's of the House of, House of Lords. But it happens a lot more than it used to. Yeah. I think you can trace this back really to the middle new Labour years when the House of Lords developed a penchant for rewriting Labour's anti-terrorist legislation mm. and there was some very, very extensive bouncing of bills between mm. Commons and the Lords then over things like the permitted period of detention without charge. Mm. And ever since then... The House of Lords has been quite keen to rewrite extensively. Remember the, the stuff about slow-moving protests a while back. All those kind of things stack up, and after a while, maybe a government's toleration levels decline, even though, as you say, this is the function of the House of Lords. It's there to say, hang on a minute, chaps, have you thought this through? Should you do this a bit differently, or will that work? Yeah. The House of Lords, I think, with some justification, would say one of the reasons they're actually sending these bills back with sort of red pen written all over them is... is is look, you know, the quality of the legislation that you are providing to us is not as good as it used to be. You're claiming extensive powers, not telling us exactly how you propose to use them. And, you know, just the overall sort of approach to the policy making process means that the legislation has got quite significant lacunae, flaws, problems with it. I mean, you think back to a recent session, the government proposed an, an education bill and then when the House of Lords started looking at it, they promptly took 13 clauses out of it at the start. And then the government decided actually they weren't going to proceed with it at all. So the House of Lords sometimes has a point. Yeah, and, that, and that's before you get on to the, the government's unfortunate habit in recent years of suddenly adding vast new sections to a bill mm. in the House of Lords that haven't been debated at all in the Commons. And yep. they're getting a bit antsy when the House of Lords doesn't like them and perhaps strikes down those changes so that the House of Commons never does have a chance to get their teeth into yep. them. Yep. So there's all that. But I, I can empathise a little bit with ministers. It gives me kind of post-traumatic memories of my O-level history essays coming back covered in red barrow with the words see me at the bottom <laughs> oh dear <laughs> you're not a grade a student a glass of water for mr darcy <laughs> well shall we come on to it's a quite a techie issue but really rather important this vexed question of what is going to happen in the west midlands to the role of the police and crime commissioner and whether his powers are going to be transferred to the mayor of the west midlands which of course is at the moment prior to the elections on 2nd of may is the conservative mayor andy street and the Police and Crime Commissioner is a Labour Commissioner, Simon Foster. Now, basically, we're talking about the role of the House of Lords and you know its importance in looking at legislation. And this is a prime example of where something has gone a bit wrong in the legislative process in terms of departments monitoring the implications of the legislation that they are passing through Parliament and getting themselves into a complete model about consultation. And the consequence of all of this is that they've just lost a proceeding in the High Court and the judge has quashed a decision taken by the Home Secretary to transfer these police and crime commissioner functions to the mayor. And we're now looking at, well, what's going to happen? We're just a few weeks away from the elections and nobody quite knows will whether there, or not... There yeah, will there Will there or won't there be an election? Will the functions be transferred? Are the people of the West Midlands going to have to be asked, after all, to vote for a police and crime commissioner whose functions might be transferred shortly after the, <laughs> the election? So it's all a bit of a mess, but it really brings to the fore questions about how we legislate. And this is, this is of course, the Hansard Society's old bugbear secondary legislation. It, it is. This is an order to transfer yeah. the powers of the yeah. police and crime commissioner to the elected mayor of the yep. West Midlands in the future. So whoever wins that election in May would previously have also taken over the police yep. force as well. So instead of having yep. two elected figures, a police and crime commissioner and a mayor, you'd have one. You'd have one, yeah. And and that is the case in a number of places. So Manchester, Andy mm. Burnham's got the police powers. In Here in London, you've got Sadiq, Sadiq Khan's got control over the Metropolitan Police with jointly with the Home Secretary. It's also Tracy Brabin in West Yorkshire. Now, there are two proposals at the moment, this one in the West Midlands and another in South Yorkshire to transfer the powers of the police and crime commissioner to the mayor. The difference between the two is that in South Yorkshire, all the parties are agreed. In the West Midlands, they're not, because you've got one Conservative mayor, one Labour police and crime commissioner. They're not agreed on, on what should happen. And the government in the Leveling Up and Regeneration Act, which it passed in October of last year, which is Michael Gove's big flagship act, 
It passed a change to the arrangements for how the transfer of powers between the police and crime commissioner and the mayor should happen. Instead of needing the approval of both parties, it replaced it with a requirement to only gain the approval of the mayor. Now, from the Labour commissioner's perspective, that was a squalid (laughs) stitch-up. Of course, we don't know whether Andy Street will still be the mayor come 3rd of May, but the assumption that this was aiding what Andy Street wanted. Now, the critical bit here is that as well as making this change, the legislation also provided for a new consultation requirement. One of the things that's happening with a lot of legislation it is littered with consultation requirements, which departments have to keep track of. But the Home Office, whose responsibility the powers of the Police and Crime Commissioner are, appear to have missed this change in the Leveling Up Act and are basically saying the Leveling Up Department didn't tell us. So they just did it by force majeure and asked people afterwards? Yes, well, it didn't quite get that. So Andy Street, after the Act was apparently passed in October, Andy Street wrote to the Home Secretary and said, could you please, therefore, transfer the powers to my office? And the Home Secretary wrote back and said, yes, absolutely, my officials will now make the necessary provisions for it. And then somewhere in the Home Office, at some point shortly thereafter, they realised, oops, we can't do that, we actually have to consult. And the Home Secretary, you could argue, had preempted the decision by writing back to Andy Street first before the consultation took place. Now, at this point, we're in early December. So the the Act got agreement assent in, in late October. We're into early December when all this discussion is obviously happening at the Home Office. And they announce a public consultation for six weeks at the end of December, so five days before Christmas, runs to the end of January. At the end of that process, January of this year, they've got 7,000 consultation responses. Now, the government's argument is, look, quite a lot of these were cut-and-paste responses, it's quality, not quantity, that matters. But even if you take out the 900 or so cut-and-paste responses the minister says they got, you still got 6,000 responses. Six days... After that consultation closes, the Home Secretary writes back to Andy Street and says, we will be transferring the functions. So obviously someone in the Home Office can do speed reading. Indeed. And this is where then you get into difficulty. So the Home Office, the following day, lays the secondary legislation, the delegated legislation, in the form of an ordering council. And uh, it has to be debated and approved by both Houses of Parliament. That happens in February and, and, and March, so both houses look at it. But in the meantime, the Police and Crime Commissioner in the West Midlands is not happy that this sort of shoddy consultation has taken place. So he whistles and, up my learned friends and takes it all to court. Yeah, so he pursues a judicial review of the Home Secretary's decision. All the while, the judge is considering this, they'd laid this order before Parliament. They have to produce the legislative text, but they're all supposed to provide supporting documentation, an explanatory memorandum and so on, for the committees and the members to scrutinise the instrument. They don't say anywhere in that explanatory memorandum what the results really of the consultation are. You know, what was the balance of opinion? How many were supporting it? How many were against it? Just the volume. So so this was essentially struck down on the basis that it was a fake sort of Potemkin consultation? Yeah, yeah. And uh, it turns out there were 50% against, 46% in favour, and 4% didn't, no, were undecided. But it took a committee in the House of Lords, the Secondary Legislation Scrutiny Committee, to get this out of ministers in subsequent correspondence, and it took MPs pressing it in the Delegated Legislation Committee, which is used to scrutinise instruments in the Commons, took them pressing the minister on what the answers were. This is the kind of information that departments, ministers are supposed to put in their explanatory memorandums to enable MPs to to scrutinise these policies. A bit of an epic fail in getting the process right here, even if, theoretically at least, the the consultation might have narrowly supported what the government wants to do but how do they get out of this one this is the difficulty we don't know and i presume the home office officials and the department for leveling up officials are now sort of scratching their heads wondering what on earth is going to happen can they do it in time for may yeah i mean if you think about the process the election administrators have got to get all the paperwork ready they've got to get ballot papers ready campaigns have got to have all their mailings ready the electoral timetable effectively kicks in from next week So the normal expectation you'd have this all done already. Are you going to reimburse the parties for their campaign costs if they start an election and then it's cancelled halfway through? Or or you, I mean, I doubt that that's the outcome. I think if they have to go ahead with the election as is, they'll have the election of a police and crime commissioner and they'll have to deal with it 
after the election, in which case the local council, the electoral administrators will have been put to an awful lot of trouble and cost. The electorate will have been asked to go out and vote for something that's shortly to be abolished. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous, really, when you think about where we are. And again, we were talking on the Rwanda bill about the role of the House of Lords. The House of Lords, in the debate on the levelling up bill, flagged some of these issues. They flagged concern about the tight timetable for the transfer of functions prior to these local elections and suggested that actually the coming into effect of these provisions should be delayed. And the government rejected it out of hand and said, no, no, we're not doing that. We're committed to the principles whereby we give six months notice to electoral administrators for changes that are going to come in. Well, they haven't done that. That's what they said they were going to do. That's what they said they wanted. But three months later, only then was the order laid before Parliament and less than three months before the electoral administrators would need to implement it. So it's a prime example of where if government sometimes listened and took sensible decisions, they'd avoid some of these problems. But they're so set on what they want and what their policy is that they don't listen and they ignore the House of Lords. Well, there's a cautionary tale there for future governments, I suspect. And talking of cautionary tales, the other thing that we learned this week are long-running parliamentary sagas is that there isn't going to be any decision anytime soon on rebuilding the buildings of the Palace of Westminster doing the long-awaited restoration and renewal project that seems to have been kicked now pretty definitively into the next parliament left for the next lot of MPs to sort out. Yeah so what's called the restoration and renewal client board which in effect is the commissions the the governing bodies of both houses have produced another report which they say is uh, setting out a pathway to enable the houses to take an evidence-based decision in 2025. <laughs> Bless. So they're now going to work up costed proposals, but we're, realistically we're back where we, we've always been. It's just another been. turn in the hamster wheel, yeah. isn't it? I mean, they've been ducking this decision forever. It's not, with the best within the world, going to be top of the agenda of any incoming government. But any incoming government, if it wanted to go ahead with this, is going to have to sign off on spending really quite enormous amounts of money. So here we are. I mean, it's the discussion we've had endlessly, so I don't suppose there's much mm. need to linger on it too much. But for heaven's sake... Mm. But I I think some interesting things are just worth pinning down, though. So full decant, the idea that um, both houses move out for most of the period of the work. It always makes them sound like a well-aged port. (laughs) It does, yeah. yeah. But with the Commons coming back, them being prioritised to return first, that's still on the agenda, and it's clear that there's been no change in thinking about where would they go if they have to do this, and that is to the Queen Elizabeth II Conference Centre for the House of Lords, just across Parliament Square, and just up Whitehall, Richmond House, which is the old Department of Health Work and Pensions building. Those are still on the agenda, and there have been some concerns that they might not be, so that is a bit clearer. This idea of continued presence, the House of Lords moves out, the Commons moves into the House of Lords, and the work is done around them, that's still on the agenda. They're Crazy, going to look at the costings. expensive, dangerous, yep. um, billions, basically because people are sentimental about keeping a footing in yeah. the Palace of Westminster. Yeah, the greater the risk, because more people are on the estate, on a building site, where you're running the national legislature, you've therefore got more mitigations that have to be put in place. That equals more cost, and, and, and on we go. But the third option, which is not quite new, because it's been on the agenda for a little bit of time, but we're getting a little bit more clarity in this report about their thinking, this idea of enhanced maintenance and improvement. It's just essentially a rolling programme of works. Keep doing patch and mend year on year. With MPs and peers in situ. Yeah, it's very hard to imagine that that's a sustainable situation given the state of the estate and the fact that the sewage works, the mechanical and engineering works all need to be done. You've got to deal with asbestos. It's hard to imagine that that's really a workable possibility, but they are looking at it. And fundamentally, they're looking at it because members don't want to move out. And the problem is nobody wants to accept responsibility and make a decision about the costs. And if the polls are right and we're looking at an incoming Labour government, this is going to land on Keir Starmer's desk, Rachel Reid's desk. And the question they've got to ask themselves fundamentally is, do they want to be the Prime Minister and the Chancellor of the Exchequer on whose watch Parliament burnt down or collapsed or somebody was killed? That's the question. And if they don't then they have to make some hard decisions. Well, Ruth, shall we pause it there for a moment? And when we come back, we're going to be talking to William Ragg, Chair of the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Select Committee of the House of Commons, about all sorts of things. All these ideas to reform central government, to start using citizens' assemblies and royal commissions to get vital reforms through, and the question of what he thinks of Mr Speaker and his handling of that debate by the Scottish National Party a little while back, and whether Mr Speaker should stay or go. 
you're enjoying the pod and think like Mark and I do that Parliament matters, why not join the Hansard Society? This year we celebrate our 80th anniversary and throughout the year we'll have a number of special events to mark this important milestone. For as little as a cup of coffee each month, you can join us and follow in the footsteps of our first members, Winston Churchill and Clement Attlee. And if you're enjoying the issues that we're talking about on the pod, you'll also be getting our special members-only Dispatch Box newsletter each week, where we bring together the best news and stories about parliaments here in the UK and around the world. You can join by going to hansardsociety.org.uk slash membership. So we've escaped the studio to come across to the Palace of Westminster to talk to William Ragg, Chair of the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee. And we're here in his office looking out onto Speaker's Court. And William, I wanted to ask you, your committee is focused very heavily on scrutiny of Whitehall. What do you think the civil service think about Parliament? How do they treat it? Well, Ruth, I'd be concerned if the sort of stereotypical view that we might think what they think is the case, that of the uh, hospital administrator might think that patients in a hospital are an impediment to the smooth running of that organisation. I would hope that we're not so lowly regarded, and I'm quite sure that we're not. Similarly, in terms of MPs' views of civil servants, I I, I trust it is actually far better than the, the stereotype would have you believe. But I think where there is, from both perspectives, an ignorance, a lack of understanding about how different groups work, be they members of parliament and the legislature or indeed civil servants in Whitehall departments. That ignorance can lead to suspicion which can morph itself into all kinds of scepticism. So I think that what it is for us all to do, whether we're members of parliament or indeed civil servants, is to understand what it is that motivates the other Do you believe in the idea of the blob, this idea that there's a sort of amorphous mob of officialdom who absorb all energy and squash all initiatives and squash anything positive any government tries to do? No, is is the short answer to that, Mark. I don't. I think sometimes there are ill-thought-through policies which are impractical to seek to implement and therefore don't go particularly far and then rather frustrated ministers can blame the so-called blob for stifling their ambitions. But more often than not, what you find is that ministers who have a clear vision of what it is they wish to achieve are capable of uh, commanding support within their departments to uh, explain what it is that they're doing, in much the same way commanding support among MPs. If MPs feel they know what the ultimate objective is, then they are able to bring forward those measures, regardless perhaps of any initial scepticism that there might be. This question about the centre of government, about how Number 10 operates, how the Cabinet Office operates, is quite a live issue at the minute, particularly that the Institute for Government recently published a report on it, and there's a lot of discussion about what if the polls are correct and we are going to have an incoming Labour government, potentially with a large majority, what are their plans for reform of the centre? Your committee's looked at this as well. What are your thoughts? Rather embarrassingly, Ruth, we came to the opposite conclusion of the Institute for Government, and uh, naturally I wouldn't want to disagree with them too publicly because I have a, in also I have a great deal of time uh, for the work that they do and indeed the effort that went into the production of this report which I think contains a number of very valid recommendations but I do remain skeptical as indeed did my committee after our short inquiry into it to that sort of key recommendation of a sort of inner cabinet now we've had models of that I suppose, but for very different circumstances, whether it was the Quad during the coalition that was there really for political management, bringing two different parties together. There's an argument that Cabinet overall is too big and has grown... You know, you know, so they have to get the little extension table on for ministers attending. Just and ministers attending, and no disrespect to any minister currently or in the past who is attending, but they sort of be dished out to those who, as a sort of consolation prize, didn't quite make it as a secretary of state. But don't worry, you can still come along and sit at the end of the table, almost like they're sort of children at Christmas time. And so I think that is maybe something we might look at to make cabinet more wieldy. But also, frankly, it's about behaviour. It's about the attitude of the Prime Minister of the day. How much do they value Cabinet government? You know, is Cabinet government there to fresh out the issues, to actually be more than simply a rubber stamping exercise to be gotten out of the way on a Tuesday morning? Which Prime Minister can you think of actually 
engaged in cabinet government. I mean, of all recent prime ministers, Blair was famously imperial. Gordon Brown pretty much was. Mm. David Cameron? I think David Cameron had to be, but that was a particular circumstance as regards coalition. Um, I think for all talk of, of, of Margaret Thatcher, she was. And many of the, the people within her cabinet were considered political heavyweights. And of course, it, it's well documented. She, she enjoyed a good argument and, and as a way to really un- understand policy. Maybe less so towards the end, but that's uh, uh, how it often goes. Now, I'm not talking about going back to the, you know, the, the days of, of Gladstone and Disraeli. We might have nine or ten people. But I think smaller cabinet that we have currently. And I think it's about valuing the good that can come from that rather than sort of seeking to almost like hide it away which I really think sort of a, a inner cabinet would inevitably would be that. You're somebody I'd sort of describe as a parliamentary man so if you had aspirations to ministerial office early on you set them aside and you've you've really focused your career on parliament. One of the trends sort of the zeitgeist at the moment in terms of decision making is this idea that an incoming government should perhaps have citizens juries, citizens assemblies and so on to help and aid decision making. A counter argument to that is that is what parliament is, that is the citizens assembly. What are your thoughts? Exactly that latter point. The House of Commons exists as that, if I, with quotation marks, say a citizens' assembly. And the more that politicians seek to delegate difficult decisions to get off the hook, frankly, the more that Parliament is diminished. And that is problematical. I'm also sceptical of citizens' assemblies because certain politicians only propose delegating certain policy decisions to them. I've not heard them talk about delegating, for example, immigration or law and order. Mm. And that leads me to think it's because they might not necessarily like the answers that come back. So we have a Citizens' Assembly, perfectly uh, well established, the House of Commons. Perish the thought there was a place that MPs could go to share their views in, in public and speak about it, the Chamber of the House of Commons, for example. And, you know, I subscribe to the Burkean idea of what an MP is as a representative rather than a delegate. And ultimately, MPs are accountable. I'm not too sure citizens' assemblies in how they're described would be. But after the next election, whoever's in government, there are any number of really, really knotty, politically charged problems that need to be sorted out. What mm. to do about the planning system, mm. whether or not any government can continue with the triple lock on pensions, the future of the NHS is another one. Mm. All those kind of things mm. are lurking in the intray for the next prime minister. And citizens' assemblies or royal commissions or whatever might assist it both in coming up with solutions, but also getting all parties to, as it were, dip their hands in the blood. I think royal commissions have their place, certainly. But what I still maintain is that the whole point of putting yourself forward for election, the whole point of wishing to be prime minister, is surely to make decisions. If you don't want to do that, or if frankly you're not up to doing it, then I'd reconsider the career that you've chosen for yourself. One of the criticisms that's made about MPs at the moment is that they are abdicating their role as legislative scrutineers. Too focused on the local, not enough on the the legislative role, the scrutiny role, whether that's law or whether that's finance as policy. What are your thoughts now after nine years as a backbencher? I think you hit the nail on the head with one of the issues, two issues. The scrutiny that the Commons gives to legislation is insufficient. Now, we've got incidences of business finishing early, so clearly not enough people are bothering to put in to speak. But then we have the other fornier issue of simply abdicating responsibility to the House of Lords for it to carry out its work. But worse still than that, you have whole swathes of new clauses, amendments brought forward by the government after the Commons has had its opportunity to scrutinise being brought to the Lords and lacking that, that scrutiny. Now, sometimes that's basically because the government doesn't make its mind up on quite how it wants legislation to be and what should be included in it. But that's not a satisfactory way to carry out scrutiny of legislation. The second thing is, what is the role of an MP? That's a much more fundamental question. Now, the role of an MP, in my mind, is, is to make the law, is to scrutinise the government, and is importantly to seek redress of grievance for constituents. But that redress of grievance now means that our time focused on constituency issues is much greater, and I understand that, I'm not saying we shouldn't do that, far from it. 
But if it's a question of who is there to record videos about potholes in our constituency and who is there to make the law, I'd suggest that MPs are there to make the law and that local councillors are there to be bothered about potholes. But increasingly all parties are looking for what are in inverted commas local champions, super councillors, mm. almost whose focus is so local mm-hmm. that... As you, as you described, turning up to debates on the detail of some law or other is pretty mm. secondary. Well, absolutely. And I, you know, I, I have the, um, the honour to represent the, my hometown. And of course, I've stood under the banner of the, a strong local voice of local champion and all this, that and the other. I mean, maybe it's possible co- to combine both. But uh, you should always remember as well that the village idiot is also local. <laughs> But how would you change it? It's very easy to say MPs should be much more focused on national issues, but if if that means they get defeated because their opponents start claiming they don't care about local people, it's pretty self-defeating. How do you change that and get more of these sort of gimlet-eyed legislative scrutineers into the chamber? I actually think that we do down the electorate sometimes about how they judge members of parliament. And in my experience, without my head swelling too much, the constituents quite like it when they are represented by somebody they consider, quotes, independent-minded. doesn't mean they agree with the Member of Parliament, far from it, but they have a respect for people who do uh, perhaps say things a little differently, perhaps do focus on issues that aren't considered fashionable. So I think that we shouldn't diminish the intelligence of the electorate, far from it. If I were to make you, by the powers vested in me, to make you... Leader of the House of Commons. Oh dear. And looking at the way the House of Commons works Mm -hmm. uh, for a backbencher Mm. and thinking about what you consider important in the role of an MP, being a legislative scrutineer and so on, Mm. what would you change? I wouldn't necessarily immediately seek to change systems, structures, timetabling, etc. I do very much think, and it must be an old romanticised idea in me, that it is about changing the behaviour of the members of Parliament. Half the time to realise what incredible things they can do if they just put their mind to it, spend a bit of time understanding how things work. And things have come to work in the way that they have over centuries. And they've done that for a reason, because it has sort of settled in a way that does work. I read articles, and I you know, may be guilty about this sometimes myself, about, oh, this place is totally dysfunctional, it's all awful, and the, you know, the little violin section is warming up in the corner. But I still think it's important that MPs seize the opportunities that are there, realise them, and maybe do a bit more of that before tinkering with systems. Let me pose the question a different way then, because I, I, to some extent I agree with you. You know, mm. the Hanson Society, you know, we've churned out over 20, 30 years lots mm. of reform proposals mm. about how we can improve scrutiny of legislation and so on. Mm. And it is very difficult to get traction on mm. them because no government wants to give up control and, and power and so on, as we know. So one of the things we're thinking about is, is you've got to change the incentive framework. And one of the ways you do that is, as you say, to change the culture and the behaviour of, of members. Mm. And one of the ways into that is helping new members coming in and start the new parliament to better understand their role, yeah. how they can use the machinery that is in the House of Commons, mm. the tools, the procedural mm. tools, to best effect as a, as a backbencher. Mm. So we're thinking about a training programme. How do we introduce MPs to... what? basics what is a bill they don't get that necessarily at the start of of parliament so thinking about that new set of mps coming in what advice would you give them first thing is know the order paper understand the order paper sit in for half a day follow the order paper you'll soon realize how it works pick up that document standing orders are not simply the preserve of the government whips office get yourself a copy available free on online (laughs) i know it sounds like onerous. When you become an MP, the idea that you have the leisure necessarily to do this, I accept, is, is, is limited. But through steady immersion, you will understand. I found the most helpful thing for me in terms of understanding the legislative process was when I was successful in being drawn within a matter of weeks in the private members ballot in 2015. And I steered through a very short bill, page and a half, but through all the different stages and got it onto a statute book invaluable for understanding, quite frankly, where the public bill office was. Yeah. I mean, perish the thought that any government whips office or opposition whips office allows the members to know where it is you go to table an amendment. But that's the problem, isn't it? That actually 
the high command of any political party doesn't necessarily want its troops to know how to rebel or how to put a different view or how to say something inconvenient or no. change legislation in a way that they don't quite like. No, 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 indeed. And, and you know, ignorance is bliss, particularly to uh, any, any leadership of any party, frankly. But ultimately, what is it that breaks through that? Well, it's the MPs. Now, look, I, I'm not that naive to realise why some people get elected to Parliament. You see that every reshuffle, whichever party is in power, people going around wanting, quotes a job. And when they're subtly reminded they have a job, and it's called being a member of parliament, they don't quite know how to respond to that because they simply become a member of parliament because they wish to be a government minister. And that's a whole different question about motivation. One final thought for us, really. You were the proposer of a motion calling on the Speaker to step down over his handling of that Scottish National Party Opposition Day debate mm-hmm. a little while ago where he allowed an extra Labour amendment to much sound and fury from various quarters. Mm. Has that all gone away a bit now? Has it all gone a bit quiet? Or is the Speaker still in a bit of jeopardy? I think he's in jeopardy because what he did was wrong. And worse still than that, what he did was in exact opposition to what he expressly said he would not do when he sought to be Speaker of the House of Commons and why I and others, particularly Conservatives, supported him. And it was, uh, in my view, a fragrantly partisan thing which he did. And the idea it was about MP safety, I'm afraid, is, is offensive because it wasn't. If it was about MP safety, it was about the safety of Labour MPs. Because for those Conservatives who would have followed the party whip, and by the way, I had intended to vote for the SNP motion unamended, but for those Conservatives, they would have voted against not just the Labour amendment that was stuck on the front, but also against the main motion until getting to the government amendment, at which point time may well have run out. So they would have voted against the word ceasefire twice. So the idea that it was about safety is also nonsense. William, you recently stepped down from the Speaker's Committee on the Electoral Commission, on which you've been a member for quite a while. Was that divesting yourself of responsibilities as you head into the sort of final months of this Parliament, or was that related to your thoughts about the Speaker? No, I didn't want to divest my responsibilities. I've always taken my role in scrutinising and working with the Electoral Commission very seriously, whether it's been part of the appointments panel for the current chair of the commission or for various electoral commissioners over the year and and the work that PACAC has done previously. So I think it's very important. No, far from divesting, I'm just afraid because I've lost confidence in the speaker, I couldn't in all conscience continue to serve upon the committee he chairs, which is why I did so and without fanfare. And until being asked this question, I, I haven't placed that on the record. But as you asked me, I thought it appropriate to answer honestly. So what happens now? Is there a realistic possibility of your motion being debated before the end of this parliament? Or is this just going to be something that rumbles around in the background without generating any particular result now? It remains there. The EDM remains there. There are a number of people who, for whatever reason, don't sign EDMs but have the same view. And unfortunately, the speaker's now compromised. Because if he's seen to do something in to the government's favour, he'll be seen by the Labour Party of trying to balance things out which is not how a speaker should behave or should be put in that position. So I think it's just left him incredibly weakened. And where does that lead? Well, I think we need a new speaker. But the question of getting there, as everything else in in Parliament is, sometimes the incumbent's best friend is apathy. William Rank, thanks very much for talking to us on the pod. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Well, Ruth, I thought that demonstrated pretty conclusively how the bitter aftertaste of that SNP Opposition Day debate and the Speaker's decision to allow that extra Labour amendment is still lingering. I mean, I'm not sure anything can actually happen about the future of the Speaker because there isn't a way to bring William Wragg's early day motion up for a debate at any point, even though it still has quite a number of signatories. But all the same, I think it does restrict the Speaker's ability to do things. He's still, if not wounded, at least pretty seriously bruised. And his authority does seem to be a bit compromised. And that shows at key moments like PMQs. Yeah, I mean, again, we, we talked about this in previous episodes, so sort of keeping track of the uh, Speaker's interventions at PMQs. And again, it was quite low-key compared to the weeks in the run-up to the Opposition Day debate, whereas in the past he's been quite on his feet and quite strong in addressing backbenchers who are barracking. He intervened three times with the word order. 
And I thought that that remark of William Raggs, that if he were to do something that seemed to favour the Conservatives, Labour would think he was trying to balance the books. Yeah. If he was to do something that seemed to favour Labour, the Conservative suspicions would be redoubled, just demonstrates the depth of the problem he's in. I mean, it wasn't a particularly great Prime Minister's questions this week. I thought it sounded as if it had been scripted by chat GBT, all these endless recycled <laughs> attack lines from the two major players. But my goodness, there will be moments even in the dog days of this parliament where the speaker has to make a ruling. And now he's got all this sort of clouds Mm. hanging over him as he does it. Mm. And I think William importantly made clear that it's not just the 90 MPs on the early day motion that they've signed it that are concerned. There are clearly others on the front bench, ministers who can't sign EDMs, who have got concerns and others in the number of the parties. So this goes more widely. And as you say, the speaker does appear to be a little bruised and concerned about how things are going to be handled in the future. But it's very difficult to see, given that the two front benches are currently supporting the Speaker, how any resolution is going to be reached. And we'll just have to go through to the end of this Parliament and and see what happens. And my other takeaway from that interview was the level of scepticism he showed about things like citizens' assemblies and various other mechanisms to try and finesse really difficult political issues so that politicians didn't necessarily have to have the blood on their hands. And I think even though he's leaving Parliament at the next election, that's a marker for the next Parliament, because I think a lot of MPs will start to feel that actually the sort of things being delegated to citizens' assemblies are properly their job. For example, a Starmer government was to start using citizens' assemblies to resolve these difficult questions about the future of the NHS or the pension system or the planning system or something else, then I think that would start to bite with a vengeance. As Leo Varadkar has found out in Ireland with uh, things backfiring there after referendums, after citizens' assemblies and so on. I thought it was interesting also his thoughts on what a a new backbencher should do to acquaint Mm. themselves with the job and the kinds of things that the whips won't necessarily tell them and how they need to sort of immerse themselves in the role, take a bit of time, sit in the chamber, absorb what's happening, look at the order paper. It's all the kinds of things that will actually be quite difficult for new backbenchers to do in those early days because they're under so much pressure and so many so demands many and requests. Do at the same yeah. Time, yeah. But that, I think, is just maintaining a step back and you know, immersing yourself in it to learn as you go along. Yeah, well, that's definitely a lesson for the next generation coming up there. Now, uh, Ruth, I gather we've got a, a listener's question to deal with. We have. So we've had a question in. Are dwindling political party memberships a cause for concern regarding the quality of people entering Parliament? Hmm. So, um... Yes. Yes, I think, I, I think we... <laughs> We're not going to disagree on this one, are we? Yes, we've sort of talked a little bit about this in previous episodes, particularly when, of course, we talked to Michael Crick about his monitoring of the selection of parliamentary candidates. If you remember when Paul War stood to be the Labour candidate in the Rochdale by-election, he wrote a piece shortly after talking about his experience. And in that, he talked about um, a selection meeting of about 320 people, which at the time struck me as quite high. And normally, in a lot of these seats, it's a a lot lower than that, reflecting the fact that actually party memberships are quite low. I mean, you know, best figures we've got, House of Commons Library Briefing, Labour about 430,000, Conservatives about 172,000, SNP somewhere between 75 and 100,000, depending upon which latest figures you use, Lib Dems about 74, 75,000. So you're talking about less than 1% of the population, even for Labour, who appear to have the most members. Um, and the so smaller you are, the less representative you are, and the more yeah. likely you are to get someone who's a candidate who appeals to a, a sort of narrow clack of local party members. I mean, this is this is why David Cameron, when he was opposition leader, started experimenting with the idea of open primaries where people could run to be the Conservative candidate for a seat which was quite an interesting experiment, and it produced some interesting people. A number of them ended up, however, in other political parties (laughs) by the end of that period. Yeah, I mean, the membership is the selection pool. It's both where you get your candidate from, but it's also where the members vote on who they want to be their candidate. It's the selectorate. And, I mean, this is not a new problem. This is not Mm. something that's just happened in recent years. Membership in political parties has been on the slide for a long time. I mean, you've got to go back to the... 
early 1950s, really, where you were getting memberships for the parties. In the millions, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, Labour had a million. Conservatives at one point claimed 2.8 million in the early 1950s. So it's a long road since then of a downward trend in membership. But Um, if you are a member of a political party, one of the few things you have these days is the right to choose a parliamentary candidate. Yeah. Almost everything else, I think their memberships and votes in conference are increasingly less influence on the actual policy of the party. Mm. The choice of leader is often at several removes and you get a vetted pair of candidates to vote for at the end of it all. Yeah. So the big thing that you have every couple of years is the chance to choose a parliamentary candidate. Yeah. Take that away and what's the point? And that's the problem that, for example, the Conservative Party has got, is that having, well, Labour as well, is, is that having given that option to party members, awfully difficult now to withdraw it, <laughs> despite the difficulties that both parties have had in terms of selecting their leaderships over recent years. So our answer is yes. <laughs> On that one. Okay, so what have we got coming up next week in Parliament? It's the week before a parliamentary recess, and by hallowed Westminster tradition, that means that if people want to get away early, the business is usually so configured that they can do it. But as it turns out, all those efforts to allow a little bit of extra getaway time have gone the way of all good intentions, because it looks like a deal between the party whips on the Investigatory Powers Amendment Bill has rather collapsed. That's been reported in the last couple of hours or so. And so there will be contested votes on some quite high-powered issues around various detailed amendments that are being proposed to that bill. There's a Labour amendment for a report on the Prime Minister's engagement with the Intelligence and Security Committee. Mm. Now, you'll remember that I don't think any Prime Minister since Theresa May has actually given direct evidence to that committee, which is a bit of a bone of contention, and Labour now want to report on that. And there are all sorts of amendments, too, around the issuing of bugging warrants on the phones of MPs and other legislators from the devolved assemblies and parliaments in this country, including one that would require a Supreme Court judge to sign off on them. So high-powered stuff indeed, Mm. and now contested votes because some sort of agreement that the Whips thought they had isn't there anymore. Mm. So it looks like, well, as you say, plans that they might have had to get back to their constituencies or other places around the world for a break won't happen perhaps as early as some of them hoped. But in any event, I mean, they're going to be working in their constituencies. They, they're oh, going to be... Elections looming. Yeah, they're going to want to get on the doorsteps in a lot of places. election campaigning. Yeah, so this media trope, I'm afraid, that they're going to take three weeks off is for the birds. But okay. otherwise, the business is pretty low-key. Pretty low-key. I mean, there's the pedicabs bill, and that's not bizarrely enough for Committee of the Whole House later in the week. And Committee of the Whole House is something you normally reserve for sort of weapons-grade constitutional legislation as opposed to a comparatively Mm. minor regulatory bill. Not unimportant, especially if you've been knocked over by a pedicab or something. But all the same, it's hardly in the same league as full-dress Lords reform. You kind of know that time is being filled up because normally that's the sort of thing that'd be done in a committee somewhere and would be brought back very briefly for a third reading and Bob's your uncle. Yeah, of course we we interviewed Nikki Aitken, whose private member's bill it originally was at uh, one of our earlier episodes on the pod. Talking of private members' bills then, Mark, I think that probably brings us to what are our plans over the next few weeks for recess, because uh, we are going to take a short break, but we have got a recess episode in the bag. We've been off to interview Wayne David, the Labour shadow minister for the Middle East, but he has um, got a private members' bill. After 23 years in Parliament, he secured a place for the first time ever in the private members' bill ballot, and he's got a bill to tackle slaps. Strategic litigation against public participation. This is the process of usually pretty rich and powerful people using the courts and the threat of defamation actions to squash critics who've been looking at their activity. So rich oligarchs taking out actions against journalists who are suddenly finding themselves thinking, crikey, I could lose my house over this. Vast legal costs being run up, nine grand for a letter or something like that. It's a very, very effective way, not only of silencing critics, but also deterring other people from even beginning to criticise. People start to self-censor rather than go there on some of these things. Mm. It's not just oligarchs and it's not just the hyper-rich, but you have to be pretty well-to-do to do it. But it's a trend that has been worrying people for a long time, and this bill from Wayne David could be one of the most significant private members' bills to be passed in this session. 
Yeah, and it's interesting to compare his experiences dealing with the Private Members' Bill at the end of his parliamentary career, when he's actually still learning things about parliamentary procedure, which he tells us about, and compare it with William Ragg, who on our earlier interview was saying, you know, he was lucky he got a Private Members' Bill in his first year, and that really helped him understand the legislative process. So it's interesting to compare the two. That episode will be coming up next week, and uh, meanwhile we'll take a short break for Easter and we'll be back the week after. See you then. See you then. Well, that's all from us for this week's episode of Parliament Matters. Please hit the follow or subscribe button in your podcast app to get the next episode as soon as it lands. And help us to make the podcast better by leaving a rating or review on Apple or Spotify and sharing your feedback. Our producer tells us it's important for the algorithm to give the show a boost. And Mark, tell us more about the algorithm. Well, what do I know about <laughs> algorithms? You know, I write my scripts with a quill pen on vellum and then send it in by carrier pigeon. <laughs> Well, before we go, a quick reminder also that you can send us your questions on all things Parliament by visiting hansardsociety.org.uk slash PMEUQ. We'll be discussing them in future episodes, including our special Urgent Questions editions dedicated to what you want to know about Parliament. And you can find us across social media at Hansard Society to get more content related to the show and the wider work of the Hansard Society. Parliament Matters is produced by the Hansard Society and supported by the Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust. For more information, visit hansardsociety.org.uk slash PM or find us on social media at Hansard Society. Yeah.